Saludos for everyone joining us live and in the recording of this conversation. I'm Christine Castro coming to you all from Salinas, California. I'm a former migrant student and current postdoctoral researcher. I'll be moderating tonight's conversation, Deconstructing Settler Colonialism and Borders, about the intersections of colonialism, border enforcement, immigrant detention, and prison abolition. This is the third of four critical conversations hosted by Haymarket Books. To see more information on the Study and Struggle Initiative and info on the next webinar, go to our website, studyandstruggle.com. Study and Struggle is invested in building communities of care, working toward prison and immigrant detention abolition with folks across the nation and with special attention to people currently and formerly incarcerated in Mississippi. Our four month curriculum was built by a group of activists, scholars, and currently and formerly incarcerated people. Any donations tonight go to the Immigrant Alliance for Justice and Equity of Mississippi. Before we begin, I'd like to express our gratitude to our interpreter and captioning team for their support and to HERD for developing tonight's accessibility strategy. HERD is an abolitionist organization that supports deaf and disabled communities impacted by the carceral system, which includes supporting the work of language justice. For tonight, we have live captioning in English and Spanish and a new deaf-centered model of ASL interpretation that inverses the power dynamics found in typical hearing-centered models of interpreting. To support Herd's work, please see the link in the chat. Many thanks also to Haymarket Books for hosting this critical conversation. We've got a great group of people tonight. I'd like to introduce our speakers. Kelly Lytle Hernandez is a professor of history, African American studies, and urban planning at UCLA, where she holds the Thomas E. Lifka Endowed Chair in History. She is also the director of the Ralph J. Bunch Center for African American Studies at UCLA. One of the nation's leading experts on race, immigration, and mass incarceration, she is the author of the award-winning books, Migra, A History of the U.S. Border Patrol, and City of Inmates, Conquest, Rebellion, and the Rise of Human Caging in Los Angeles. Nick Estes is Kul Wakasa, a citizen of the Lower Brule Sioux Tribe, born and raised in Chamberlain, South Dakota, next to our relative Minnesota, the Missouri River. His nation is the Oseti, Sakowin, Ayote, the Great Sioux Nation, or the Nation of the Seven Council Fires. Nick is an assistant professor of American Studies at the University of New Mexico and a member of the Oak Lake Writer Society, a group of Dakota, Nakota, and Lakota writers. In 2014, he co-founded the Red Nation in Albuquerque, New Mexico, an organization dedicated to the liberation of Native people from capitalism and colonialism. Harsha Walia is the award-winning author of Undoing Border Imperialism. Trained in the law, she is a community organizer and campaigner in immigrant justice, anti-capitalist, feminist, and anti-imperialist movements, including No One is Illegal and Women's Memorial March Committee. Lorena Quiroz is a 22-year Mississippi resident Born in Ecuador by way of New York, she's an organizer and mother of three amazing girls, first-generation Afro-Latinas, born in beautiful Delta Flatlands. She's the founder of the Immigrant Alliance for Justice and Equity, an organization whose purpose is to amplify the voices of marginalized, multiracial, and immigrant communities by active participation and civic engagement in deconstructing barriers that perpetuate racial, xenophobic, socioeconomical and gender identity and sexual disparities and oppression. Like I said, a great group of folks tonight. Um, we will start just for the, uh, the group that is getting any donations for tonight, if you happen to donate through the Eventbrite, that is going directly to Immigrant Alliance for Justice and Equity of Mississippi. And just to hear a little bit from you, Lorena, um, about the work that's happening in Mississippi and the work of the Immigrant Alliance. Hi, everyone. Hello, Christine. Um, yeah, so uh, our organization, IAJE uh, for short, uh, it's a, a very new organization, uh, although many of us, the folks that founded it, have been working in the state for, for decades. This organization was really, took its movement after the August 7th, 2019 raids. 
uh, that affected uh, 780 folks, um, 680 of which were detained, 100 of which were uh, lost their jobs immediately afterwards due to the to the ICE raids. And so the organization uh, is it, a labor of love. It's uh, the work that was created through the organizers that were not only from Mississippi, but also uh, from the region and nationals that came down to provide support to the community. Uh, it's uh, also continues to be run by immigrants. Uh, just about the entire uh, staff is immigrant or indigenous uh, uh, or a person of color. And we want to continue to do this work to uplift the voices of uh, the community that has been silenced for so long, specifically in, in the state of Mississippi. That's wonderful work, Lorena, um, and wonderful too also that it's all immigrant led in the valuable community of Mississippi. Um, and I want to get us sort of introduced to all, all, all of us together, Nick, Kelly, Lorena, Harsha. Um, if you could just each go uh, one by one introducing yourself through the framework of abolition and how the abolitionist struggle relates to the project of dismantling settler colonialism and border imperialism. Um, Nick, can we start with you? Sure. I just want to greet you all in my traditional Lakota language uh, with a, an open heart and a handshake. Uh, I'm calling from uh, Tiwa territory, which is also known as Albuquerque. It's a crossroads in Indian country uh, that brings together over 290 different indigenous nations where the Red Nation was founded. And so I can talk a little bit about uh, the founding of the Red Nation and how it relates to the questions of abolition, but also uh, challenging settler colonialism. First of all, um, indigenous people are often thought of as kind of rural people who don't live uh, within the confines of a city. But nonetheless, um, the majority of indigenous people live in cities or urban based populations, especially in the United States, I would say more so in the US than in a place like Canada. And with that, we face certain challenges, increased rates of incarceration, uh, lack of housing, uh, increased uh, forms of police violence, um, accompanied by certain, you know, economic conditions. So in the work of the Red Nation, we've done a lot of things uh, to address, uh, you know, today. So, for example, it's snowing here. We have unseasonal weather. Um, snow is a good thing, but it's bad in the sense that there's been an increase in evictions of people from homes uh, because of COVID-19 and the inability to pay rent, even though there is, sure, Sure. Yeah. Um, so we had to pause because of the captioning. There's a problem in, with captioning. So we'll wait for the captions to catch up. Okay, so we're good to go. Uh, so with the, inc the increase of cold weather in this particular moment in time, you have also the convergence of, uh, you know, increased evictions, even though we live, you know, with a, a democratic uh, mayor and city council, um, nonetheless, and they say there's no evictions happening, but you can see that there's a street, uh, there's an increased level of people living on the streets. And most of those people are indigenous. And so this is one of the reasons why we formed the Red Nation back in 2014. We actually started a campaign called hashtag NDN, which stands for No Dead Natives. 
where we sought to entirely eliminate exposure deaths. Um, and we haven't, you know, unfortunately, we haven't been successful. Uh, and where this, you know, intersects with the question of abolition is understanding uh, that abolition and caretaking specifically is a dialectic between uh, space and place, right? Uh, and abolition, as Ruthie Gilmore defines it, is about presence, uh, uh, or what she says as life in rehearsal, and not a, a life in recitation of rules. Um, and that is, you know, fixed with uh, carceral regimes, displacement, you know, displacement from the reservation, but also the constant displacement of indigenous people within the city itself. Um, and so with the work of the Red Nation, you know, Right now, we're focused on, like as many uh, indigenous organizations, on the land back campaign in the city of Albuquerque, but also working uh, in other cities as well. So, for example, Rapid City, a place where I'm actually from in South Dakota, it's the heart of the Lakota Nation in uh, the Black Hills. There's currently an encampment called Mini Luzaha uh, Camp that is has set up an emergency shelter system for indigenous people who are experiencing homelessness. Uh, again, um, okay, so I think the captions stopped again, so I'll, I'll pause for a second. Are we good to go with the captions? I think we're trying to figure out the caption situation for those who are listening and watching. Those who are tuning in, we're just waiting for captions um, to get synced up. 
you're just joining us, please be patient with us as we figure out this captioning. Uh, accessibility is of the utmost important for, to, uh, importance to us. Uh, so we're really grateful to all of you for your patience right now. Okay, I think we're good to go. Uh, Christine, would you mind posing the question again? Absolutely, Nick, thank you. Um, you were speaking to us about your work specifically through the abolitionist struggle and the abolitionist lens and tying it to the project of dismantling settler colonialism um, and border imperialism. And you told us about really important work with uh, the Red Nation um, and understanding how uh, things like incarceration, policing and evictions, especially as they're ramping up now during COVID-19 are all interconnected. Um, and that we should remember that as we move forward. Could you tell us a little bit more about um, where you were going? I believe you left off uh, talking about a community in South Dakota. Yeah, that's correct. Um, so there is a temporary emergency encampment in Rapid City, a place that we call um, Mini Luzahan that is providing emergency shelter for uh, mostly indigenous people, but also anybody who comes there uh, in the harsh winter months. And so, you know, just to wrap up um, this intro, it's to say that uh, organizations such as the Red Nation, we're not just against, you know, uh, police uh, and pipelines, as well as, you know, incarceration in general, um, but we're actually trying to create a, a political alternative from the ground up by providing spaces. And so here in this city, we also, uh, we have a Beyond Borders Caucus that works with uh, migrant communities and helps uh, people access those as well. And so we're trying to create, um, you know, as Ruthie had said, it's a, a caretaking and abolition, the dialectics of space and place at work. Thank you so much for that, Nick, uh, and especially for tying abolition as care work. Um, Harsha, if we could hear from you and, and your work, again, through that abolitionist lens um, and the project of dismantling settler colonialism and imperialism, uh, and perhaps a little bit more of this tie towards abolition and uh, deconstructing uh, borders as care work. Sure, thank you. Can people hear me okay? Okay, uh, 
Thank you all for, for having us. It's an honor to be here. Um, I'm on unceded Coast Salish territories, lands of the Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh, and Squahomish people. Uh, and for me, that's particularly important in the context of talking about abolition, um, not just as kind of you know a land acknowledgement, but really to recognize the ways in which carceral systems are fundamentally written and underwritten by settler colonialism. Um, and when I first came to Turtle Island, when I first came to these lands, um, I was actually under a removal order and was briefly detained. And so for me, um, when I was first um, offered citizenship, if you will, on these lands, it was by Indigenous nations and Indigenous communities um, that I worked alongside. And so for me, this is so important in terms of personally and also politically expressing my gratitude um, and very much aligning with Indigenous nationhood uh, rather than the settler colonial state. And for me, that informs my politics around border imperialism and abolition uh, is an affirmation of Indigenous land, Indigenous nationhood, and Indigenous sovereignty. Um, and uh, so I'm here in, in so-called Canada uh, on unceded Coast Salish territories. And um, the work that I'm, I'm part of uh, in terms of the No One is Illegal movement is very much rooted in um, a migrant justice movement that is anti-capitalist, anti-colonial and anti-imperialist because we understand the ways in which borders are fundamentally carceral regimes, right? So uh, the U.S. border in particular, if we look at its founding, um, you know, there's there's many things that we can talk about, but I think one thing that I would highlight, which is so clearly connected uh, to, um, to abolition, is the ways in which, you know, the, the southern border was really solidified particularly in relationship to anti-Black enslavement, right? That the border was actually solidified in order to keep enslaved people from escaping and fleeing into Mexico. And so I think that's so important that when we think about migrant exclusion and the ways in which deportation and detention is state violence, that we recognize that the very foundation of the border was actually, and has always been to control mobility. And the control of mobility is what uh, what um, carceral regimes are all about, right? Prisons and borders are very similar in their capture and containment of people and restriction of mobility. Um, and so I think it's so important that we understand the very history of the border um, through its tactic to control mobility and particularly its anti-Black and anti-Indigenous history. And I think we often um, lose that in contemporary migrant justice kind of politics, which is that we see racial exclusion as separate from anti-Black and anti-Indigenous genocides, but the entire um, conception of the border is underwritten by, by that violence. And globally, that is true as well. The entire British Raj um, and the, the formation of modern, so-called modern nation states was to use borders to capture indentured labor and the movement of millions of people uh, through indentured labor regimes, which are the kind of current formation um, of temporary labor programs. So there's there's a lot there, but I think it's important for us to understand the ways in which the movement of people and the ways in which that is contained uh, by borders is uh, fundamentally a project that if we are to undo borders, that is an abolitionist project. And so No One Is Legal, which is uh, a movement that I'm part of, has for decades, <laughs> for decades, articulated a vision of No One Is Illegal, which is an understanding that we do not want any detentions, we do not want any deportations, and we reject the divisions between so-called good and bad or desirable and undesirable migrants. Um, and that we kind of, you know, in the ways in which abolitionist politics calls on us to do, which is to refuse innocence. Um, similarly, uh, you know, and of course, um, echoing as Nick did Ruthie Gilmore's invocation that we refuse the politics of innocence. Uh, for me, the, the movement around known as legal um, and its corollary, which is no one is legal. Sometimes we, our movement is called no one is legal. We often say no one is legal. Canada is illegal. Um, and we use those together um, to, again, you know, make those connections between uh, the ways in which legality is a completely social construct and that no human being is illegal and that nation states are illegal. Thank you so much for that, Harsha. We're going to take a quick pause for our interpreters and our caption to catch up. <laughs> 
All righty, good to go. Kelly, um, if we can hear from you also about your work and understanding the intertwined histories, uh, maybe even symbiotic histories of uh, border imperialism, enforcement, detention, uh, and an abolitionist project. Sure, thank you very much. Um, I'm coming to you from Tovangar, um, the homeland that traditionally taken care of by the Tongva and Gabrielino peoples. And I want to thank everybody for participating in this conversation tonight. I've actually never had an opportunity to meet Harsha, so it's wonderful to be with you and to listen and to learn from you. Um, and Nick, who's with us tonight, of course, I've um, been learning from Nick for quite some time. So, um, and Lorena, I can't wait to get into the conversation with you as well. So my own work, uh, I enter abolition through a variety of, of pathways, primarily the historical. Um, I've been working on race, immigration, and mass incarceration for about two decades now. And when I began working on uh, my most recent book called City of Inmates, that's when I really had the, the major political shift to understand settler colonialism as a foundation, if not the foundation, for the rise of mass incarceration. And I came to that really through an ar archival and theoretical education that I received. So in the archives, when I began writing this book, but which is about how Los Angeles built the largest jail system, um, if not in the nation, but on earth, um, in the archive, when you track it back as far as you can go, the origin story of criminalization, of policing, of incarceration in this city, this place now known as Los Angeles, is the criminalization, the policing, the caging of Tongva, Gabrielino peoples. And so when you archivally and historically recall the origin story of mass incarceration in an area that has become one of the flashpoints of this crisis um, in the world, it forced for me um, a new journey of learning about the importance of settler colonialism, about a particular form of invasion that's predicated upon native elimination in body and in um, politics and sovereignty and how that became the foundation for a variety of carceral tactics and experiences for BIPOC communities across time here in Los Angeles. So it was through that historical and archival journey that I really came to understand and appreciate um, the foundational significance of occupation to the creation of carceral regimes. And then have now reinterpreted my whole body of work and everything that I'm doing through that frame, especially when it comes to um, immigration control, um, that we do not live in this nation of immigrants, the, the myth of the nation of immigrants. Um, we live in a nation of settlers that has formulated a set of rules and systems to regulate um, BIPOC communities. So I, I come to this understanding in the archival sense, the historical sense, coming out of Tovangar and understanding how this place became the home of the largest jail in certainly in the United States. Um, but I also, in the last couple of years, have been doing abolition work at the very technical level. So I, I run a project here in Los Angeles or at UCLA called Million Dollar Hoods. And what we do at Million Dollar Hoods is we collect up police and jail data to calculate and map how much is being spent on incarceration per neighborhood. And in some neighborhoods, more than $1 million per year is being spent locking up local residents. Those are LA's million dollar hoods. Of course, we are borrowing from and learning from the Million Dollar Blocks Project and the work Eddie Ellis and others um, who really came to understand the zip code significance, the spatial significance um, of policing and incarceration. So at Million Dollar Hoods, the work that we've been doing in terms of abolition is technical, it's practical. It's about exposing the fiscal and human costs of mass incarceration in our local communities, and then driving a conversation about how we reallocate resources, how we strip it out of policing and incarceration to move it into those systems of care that Nick and Harsha have lifted up for us into education into jobs, into rethinking our set of social relationships and our responsibility and our accountability to one another as human beings. So I've come to this in, in both sense, as a scholar from the historical to archival, but also um, at the practical level. And all of it's been tied together by understanding um, 
that the origins here of it all is in invasion and occupation, uh, which is continuing to this very moment today. Thank you so much for that, Kelly. Um, and especially in, in making uh, sure to call attention to the sort of shift from historical work into this technical work and all of it driven by care um, and in changing these systems. Uh, Lorena, if we could go to you um, and specifically to talk about your work in, in Mississippi, how that aligns with this project of abolition, working with the Immigrant Alliance for Equity and Justice. Um, and if you could also touch on something that Kelly just brought up, the spatial significance. You're working in a space that's very different from uh, urban spaces that have been uh, mentioned so far. Uh, you're working in a very rural area. So if you could also touch on the importance of that for your work. Um, but before you do, if we could just take a uh, pause for captioning. Uh, we are trying to get our caption back up. I thank you all for your patience as we continue uh, with this commitment towards accessibility. And it looks like we're back. Lorena, if we could hear from you. Yeah, um, so echoing the, you know, the, the history of, of uh, incarceration, uh, how it was designed for profit and to suppress power. And of course, the settlers stealing land and then incarcerating the same folks uh, that, you know, that they, um, uh, that they dispossessed. And then, of course, after slavery, we know how, uh, you know, in Mississippi uh, and uh, states, how the prisons were built to ensure that black folks, uh, um, you know, were suppressed. Um, and then directly, uh, my work is directly with the community. Um, we see that ICE was created to suppress, uh, of course, the immigrant community. It was, um, it's, it, it grew up directly out of, the white supremacy to exploit our people. And so we are at a very different stage um, in Mississippi um, because, of course, of, of the systemic oppression. Um, also because immigrants' voices have been silenced for so long. And then, of course, we have the rural space. So we were a perfect target for ICE. Uh, so all these things, especially we know that the EEOC and some of the poultry plants, um, the EEOC uh, did sue some of the poultry pans, plants and they won a case uh, with several million dollars. All of this was the perfect reason for ICE to come and target and punish our people. So again, we see this being the cycle of oppression and of punishing our people being repeated over but as I mentioned, we are at a very different stage because our community uh, does not have what you would call uh, a movement. Um, and so our work is, I would say it's in, in the infancy stages where we're trying to create leadership with the community. And that is in the organizer speak slow and intentional uh, because the communities have been so oppressed so silenced and then recently traumatized. We had ICE, we have, you know, COVID. Um, our focus is on creating leaders in the community uh, with, of course, the political education that goes along with that uh, and helping people imagine that things could be different. Um, because we're in a rural area, People are not, uh, a lot of the things that they hear in the media or they think, or even that organizers from regional and national organizations have come to the table are, are difficult for people to imagine, uh, for people to think that they can actually uh, create this huge movement in a state such as ours and create change. And so what the way that we are addressing it is through these very small actions, very small activities, and of course, creating the power within each of our of our leaders. Um, it, it's 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 um, 
it's emotional work because the folks that are uh, doing this work are people that were affected by immigration. Of course, like, you know, I, like some of you here uh, directly, and this is not uh, an issue based work. This is our life. You know, we feel it. We've had either some of us, our parents are dealing with this. Um, we have organizers whose parents have been deported. And so, of course, we want to make sure that that's something that's uh, that's centered around the work that we do, uh, where we want to uh, ab abolish the systems of, of oppression that are causing so much pain to our folks. Awesome. Thank you so much, Lorena. And I want to move to the questions that we had for um, this portion of the curriculum for study and struggle under session five and session six. I'll be going through each and letting you know where that question is directed to, um, but all of those questions will be open to you for. Um, and I want to start with one because we're all coming from very different, uh, you know, life experiences at the moment, different disciplines, uh, different focuses, and so the. The basic question here is just understanding the term, what is settler colonialism? Um, and if I can hear from, from Nick on that, and also Lorena, uh, I think it's important to highlight that uh, the community that you're working with uh, has a significant population of mom speakers uh, from Guatemala who are indigenous folks themselves, but in what is now current day United States. So the question is, what is settler colonialism? Yeah, settler colonialism can seem like an academic term and I'll try, I'll probably give an academic definition, <laughs> but it's the process uh, by which a foreign invading population uh, seizes land, often by force, sometimes through coercion or any other means, and attempts to replace the uh, native population um, with that population. Uh, and I would say that it's while, you know, there are kind of genocides that exist and do happen within this process, it doesn't target uh, just human life alone, like, say, the Holocaust uh, in, in Europe. Um, but also targets uh, relations with non-human life uh, itself. And that's, like, I would say specifically targeting relations with territory. So, for example, a city is a really good example to say it targets indigenous people's relations with this territory because it's not readily seen as an indigenous space. Uh, and, you know, even, even in places like Mississippi, not seen as an indigenous space, but nonetheless is. And the other, the flip side of that would also be that um, that a lot of, you know, a lot of Latin American countries aren't seen as settler colonial, but nonetheless uh, do are are you know uh, settler colonial. And there's a really good book um, by Shannon Speed um, that I would recommend people reach out uh, uh, read because she does uh, interview um, migrant women uh, specifically in detention facilities, most of whom, uh, or I think all of whom are indigenous. And so that's another form of indigenous erasure and indigenous elimination when people cross a border. Um, and so like settler colonialism's primary function is indigenous elimination, but it's not only about indigenous people as Kelly uh, Laurel Hernandez has said, and also as Harsha Walia and Lorena, um, friends, you know, comrades uh, have also spelled out. Thank you for that, Nick. <clears throat> Apologies. Uh, and Lorena, uh, something that uh, Nick just said really struck me, that Mississippi isn't seen as an indigenous space, but in fact it is, um, right? Not, not just in its history, but in its contemporary form. How do you see that showing up in your work? Um, so, so we know all, all the Guatemala uh, refugees that fled their countries um, and, and they are incarcerated here now. And I'm sorry, something popped up on the screen. Um, and that uh, the weapon of choice of colonialism is genocide. And part of that is the cultural and, and, and physical um, um, erasure of, of the people. So you see that reflected here 
uh, where even uh, the folks or the experts in the field <laughs> that came to, to help our people uh, didn't even acknowledge that the majority of the folks, about 90% of the folks that were detained were indigenous, Mayan, Mom, Quiche, Quiche, forgive me, um, and several other um, uh, um, Mayan uh, um, uh, people. And so uh, being aware of that, is super important to be able to direct any kind of sustainable or effective work in Mississippi. Uh, if we enter into these spaces where the poultry plants are, the majority of the people are of indigenous and of the indigenous descent. But when you are not familiar with uh, the cultural nuances that exist in these populations, uh, you tend to erase uh, indigenous people. And that's what a lot of organizations have done. They have come in with this supposed knowledge, you know, that uh, because people look a certain way, um, they speak Spanish, they're automatically from Mexico, and we have a, a myriad of nationalities, and they try to erase that. And that's why the work that uh, we're trying to do is so intentional in making sure we lift up the voices of the indigenous people in our community. Um, anecdotally, in these spaces, 30% of the folks are, are immigrant. Um, that is not reflected in, in census numbers. You know, I think it's barely in the single digits. And so, um, again, uh, being aware of, of the not just what is existing here, but also the, the the history of folks that, you know, ended up and why they came to this country is so important as we, we develop a, a work and we continue to, to try to, um, to change things in, in the state. Thank you, Lorena. Um, and Harsha, if I could ask you this next question. What does settler colonialism have to do with territory and nation state borders? Uh, and I'm, I'm asking you that question because of your comment that you made, right? The supposed state of, Can you know, the supposed nation of Canada. Um, so the question again, what does settler colonialism have to do with territory and nation state borders? Sure, just that, just that small question. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, picking up on uh, everyone's comments, really, but you know, in in the context of settler colonial states uh, like the U.S., Canada, Australia, Israel, um, states in in uh, South America as well, which are not often considered settler colonial states, but certainly have a history of settler colonization, um, as Nick pointed out. Uh, you know, the entire formation of the nation state is connected to settler colonialism in that its entire project is about uh, usurping indigenous lands. Uh, it's about indigenous elimination and it's about falsely imposing uh, a new jurisdiction, right? right? Like an entire new state structure. Um, and I think, you know, one of the things uh, in settler colonial contexts like the U.S. and Canada that we don't really think about, but that we need to think about is that we don't think about settler colonialism as a form of imperialism, right? We think about imperialism like U.S. imperialism as happening over there, right? Like, you know, it's a, it's a thing that happens in the global south, if you will. Um, but, you know, George Manuel, um, he talked about the location of indigenous peoples uh, within you know, he was coming from the context of Canada, but really arguably applicable elsewhere, is he talked about Indigenous peoples as being uh, of the fourth world, right? So, you know, in the so-called first world, but conceptually aligned with the third world in terms of settler colonialism really being an extension of imperialism, um, in that it's about conquest, it's about um, land, it's about theft of resources, it's about domination, and very much about the imposition um, of a completely new jurisdiction that impacts, as Nick pointed out, um, indigenous peoples, but also lands and resources and non-human beings, right? It's extractive um, in that way. So it's entirely about territory and the creation of a whole new juridical system, right? New laws um, that are intended to dominate. Um, and I think the thing that is uh, so insidious in our current context uh, about the conflation 
um, of white supremacy in the nation state is this weird perversion where white supremacists are now kind of aligning themselves and describing themselves as the so-called vanishing Indian trope, right? Where they're somehow the victims now <laughs> of migrants, where they position themselves as victim, you know, victims of migrant invasions, uh, which completely erases, of course, the actual ongoing settler colonial project. So I think um, always kind of centering um, the ways in which the uh, in which white supremacy um, is found is like a material structure, right? It's 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 not just about privilege or white privilege or, or being white passing, and it's also about that. But it's really about the material foundations of all of our social structures and the border and the nation state um, are very much about territory and land um, and indigenous elimination. And I think uh, the other piece that I would point out um, to pick up on what Lorena and Nick were talking about in the second round. Um, is how important it is um, that we not erase Indigenous peoples in contemporary conversations around migration, right? Like migration is somehow seen as a non-Indigenous issue, uh, when in fact we know that the vast majority of people who are forced to, you know, as Shannon Speed calls it, to transit between settler states uh, is are really Indigenous peoples. Um, from all over the world. And, you know, in the U.S. context, of course, that's very specific to uh, the Caribbean and South and Central America. But that migration is is um, is very much an indig a contemporary Indigenous issue, right? Indigenous people are not kind of static in that trope, as, you know, Nick pointed out, um, are very much in, in, in cities are, you know, all spaces, Indigenous space, uh, and Indigenous peoples are everywhere. Um, so I think it's really important that we um, also uh, center the experience of Indigenous peoples within migration and not think of migration as something that is does not include Indigenous peoples. Um, so, you know, that's that's something that I, I think is uh, really important as well in, in terms of how we think about territory in the state and movement. And this is, of course, on top of the very obvious, which is the ways in which the border itself criminalizes indigenous nations, particularly those who are uh, forced to deal with the imposition of um, borders on their territories. And this is very live right now in T Tohoni Odom, of course, um, you know, where they're opposing uh, the wall on their territories. And with that, we see the uh, the confluence of, you know, the Indian wars and the border security industrial complex very much in one territory, in one nation, which is one of the most militarized communities in the entire United States. Um, and that's similar in Canada. Akwesasne uh, is an indigenous community that is forced to straddle now the so-called U.S. and so-called Canada. And they have for decades uh, been, uh, been opposing uh, the imposition, the foreign imposition of the Canadian-U.S. border on their territory. Thank you so much for that, Harsha. We're going to take a brief pause for our captioning and interpreting to catch up. Alrighty, uh, Kelly, if I can ask you another small question, uh, what the relationship is between settler colonialism and the prison industrial complex? Um, and if you could uh, briefly describe for our audience what we mean by the term prison industrial complex, that would be awesome. Oh, hello. Um, well, first, let me just say thank you to Viron and Topher who are doing the interpretation. You are just really keeping up with all of us and helping us to make sure that we're open and speaking with everyone. So thank you for your work. Um, so the question was, what is the relationship between settler colonialism and the prison industrial complex? So the way that I think about the prison industrial complex is the way in which a set of practices for policing and incarceration have developed to extract profit from bodies and to extract profit from that system. Um, so the prison industrial complex is profit oriented to make sure that people 
a small group of people are benefiting financially in particular from um, all of the cages, all of the police, all of the guns, all of the borders that are being established um, across what is now known as the United States. So that's how I understand um, the prison industrial complex and maybe others would like to, to add to that. Its relationship between to settler colonialism, well, we can certainly go back and, and look at the border. Um, the border is one of the most highly militarized zones of the United States. The construction of the wall today and across the course of the 20th century was a way of shifting resources from the federal government largely into the hands of private companies that um, profit from building these, these walls. So that is one example, like a real clear cut example of how um, industries are benefiting and therefore driving the creation and the expansion of the carceral state. We have many examples. I'm sure Lorena in Mississippi can give us local examples of what's happening there. But the, the formation and the strength of the carceral system of mass incarceration is grounded in the profits that it, it delivers for a small segment of society and what it extracts from disproportionately black and indigenous communities. Um, which only accentuates the hierarchies that have developed over time. So that's how I think about the relationship between settler colonialism and um, the prison industrial complex. Thank you, Kelly. And you brought up a really good point about Lorena's work in Mississippi um, and the sort of uh, shift of resources from the federal government to private companies. Um, Lorena, I was wondering if you could talk to us a little bit about how this complex shows up in the detention centers that are in Mississippi, whether they're publicly run, whether they're privately run, and if you feel like that has some sort of connection to uh, settler colonialism and the prison industrial complex. Yeah, um, of course, you know, I, I mean, ICE, we're, we're pretty, ICE is pretty young, so we know it's completely uh, profit-based. Uh, we saw it reflected again on August 7th uh, when we had uh, three detention centers where the majority of the folks were, were detained and as we send out our organizers there, uh, detention centers started popping up everywhere. Um, and so we know a lot of these different cases uh, that could, people that could have been released, that should have been released were being held because they're, what they are is just, you know, a dollar amount. Um, we have the judges that refuse to let folks in because they, they are working with the system, uh, refusing to give uh, folks bail uh, just to hold them on a little longer to let them go by their third try and so it's profit based um and uh there uh there's just no denying it um did did you uh, ask for a specific i'm sorry i didn't catch i was kind of following the flow of, of what kelly was saying no worries. I, I was just asking about um, the the detention centers, which you touched on just popping up after the August 7th raid. Um, we are going to take a quick pause for a switch in interpreters. Alrighty, and we're back. Sorry, Lorena, did you have anything else to add? 
Um, I think we'll move to the next question, if that's okay. And all of you in your answers so far have uh, touched on this, and if we can get uh, to the specific point, how can we understand the relationship between settler colonialism and racial capitalism? And how can we make these connections clear? Several of you have already pointed out uh, that settler colonialism is an extractive system. Um, how do we understand the connection between that extractive system and racial capitalism? I'm sorry, Nick, if we could start with you. For sure. Um, I was hoping to get this question. Just kidding. <laughs> um, I would say that settler colonialism is an iteration of racial capitalism. Uh, and the reason, and we should talk about racial capitalism before we talk about settler colonialism. The reason why we say racial capitalism and not just say capitalism is to understand that capitalism has its origins within a specific racial order. And the class-based system that we understand or that we have inherited here was actually started in Europe. And this is what Cedric Robinson documents in his book, Black Marxism. Europeans colonized Europe first and created a kind of racial order um, that became, you know, some people became the ruling class, others became the modern day proletariat because their land was um, enclosed and privatized, thus creating a pool of laborers, of wage laborers to work in the factory system. So that's one, that's one side of it. The second side of it is that you know the modern steam engine, if we look at that and the birth of the fossil economy and the beginning of you know what a lot of people call you know um, the Anthropocene or whatever, you know, I would just say that it's the birth of modern capitalism through the wage system. And the steam engine, you know, that happened uh, that was created and invented in the cotton mills or used in the cotton mills, I should say, in England required the labor. Uh, the, you know, the enslaved labor of African people stolen from their own continent um, to pick that cotton, to go into those cotton mills, right? That cotton had to be grown on stolen land from indigenous people, right, through the, the, the process of settler colonialism. And so that's why I would say, I think um, the interpreter froze. Do you want me to pause? Yes, please. Okay, so that system was exported here in the form of settler colonialism, right? This this race, uh, this race based but also class based system, um, you know, founded on the 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 profit motive in order to commodify both labor and land or nature, um, and we can see this codified uh, more, uh, I, I think, earlier than that in something called the doctrine of discovery was later codified in federal Indian law um, that basically granted European powers uh, preemptive rights to entire continents and nations of people, thus dividing the globe right um, into the Christian and non-Christian nations. And so what, what that says is that capitalism didn't produce racism, that racism um, 
was inherited from uh, primarily from the European kind of societies. It's not to say that non-European societies didn't have racism, but nonetheless, it was deeply embedded within this particular form of government uh, and uh, uh, economy. Uh, and this kind of preempts what W.E.B. Du Bois called, you know, the problem of the 20th century, which was the problem of the color line, right? And the, um, the present kind of global division of humanity concerns those who live with war and suffering and those who live in countries that perpetuate it, right? The, the 21st century color line, right? Um, and I think what Harsha Walia, you know, does so eloquently in her book that's forthcoming through Haymarket, which I've had the opportunity and privilege to read, is talk about that the, you know, borders aren't built uh, you know, uh, just to kind of keep people out, right? Because they hate brown people, right? And uh, there's not this kind of essential character of the United States that it just hates brown people for whatever reason. It hates native people because of our language or religion or culture or whatever it is. It's because it's tied to a specific form of profit making, right? By creating precarious uh, groups of people you can drive down wages, you can pay them less, right? You can put them into constant fear where they can't organize effectively to demand higher wages, right? That's a very basic way of putting it. But the, the world itself, uh, in, you know, and I'm glad that Harsha brought this up, settler colonialism is fundamentally an imperialist project. The annexation of territory is fundamentally an imperialist, you know, aim, right? Any kind of annexation of territory. So settler colonialism isn't a domestic thing. It's not a domestic issue. So that project has been exported primarily. I'm just speaking of the U.S. project here has been exported to the rest of the world in the forms of economic sanctions, in the forms of 800 military bases to encircle entire nations of people, right? To assert and to control shipping lanes, right? And there's a reason why None of those sanctions, um, you know, are against European nations, right? It's a system of racial, global racial capitalism, and its iteration here in this land is a form of settler colonialism. I hope I explained that <laughs> in, in simple terms. Thank you for that, Nick. And actually, since you brought up Harsha's book, um, Harsha, could we hear from you uh, on what... Uh, Nick is bringing up this idea of borders aren't just built to keep people out, which is what we see a lot of in terms of our sort of pop culture understanding of what borders do. And in a, in a way, in the simplest way, it is there is some truth to that, right, uh, in terms of, of uh, xenophobia, prejudice, racism. Um, but can you speak a little bit more to this question, uh, how we understand that relationship between settler colonialism and racial capitalism? Sure. <laughs> these are these are such amazing questions that I'm just like <laughs> they're so um, profound and I, I'm just uh, so honored to be in this conversation and to to think through um, with other comrades um, on this. It's it's such an honor and a delight, really. Um, I think um, precisely as you know, as Nick said, the relationship between I think there's two two parts to that question: the relationship between racial capitalism and settler colonialism that I'll address first, and the second about, you know, the border and whether it's just to keep people out. Um, and I will say, you know, uh, thank you, Nick, for for plugging the book and mentioning it. But, you know, there are so many others who have who've written and are, are doing this, this good work as well. Um, in terms of the relationship between racial capitalism and, and settler colonialism, Nick's already outlined it. And, you know, really, it's that race is not secondary to capitalism, right? And I think, this is especially critical in our current context where so much of the left um, and really the white kind of social democratic left, if I, if I may say that, um, really believes that we can overcome um, the stratifications of race simply through economic justice, right? And that somehow race is secondary to the impacts of capitalism or that white supremacy is really uh, a symptom of a kind of squeezed citizenry, right? That white supremacy comes from that uh, kind of trope of um, the white working class man who is being squeezed by austerity. And I think really what is so pivotal about racial capitalism and the work of Cedric Robinson and Robin Kelly and so many others um, that is so useful to us and so necessary for us is that we understand race is not secondary to capitalism and that the division of labor 
actually also requires the division of laborers, right? It's not just the division of labor, it's also the division of laborers and the division of land and territory. And that expropriation, the kind of exploitation and expropriation and exploitation of capitalism means that land and labor and people and humanity um, are all divided and exploited. And that racism is so central to settler colonialism, so central to enslavement, so central to surveillance, so central to wage labor, like it is just foundational to all of these forms. Um, and in the context of settler colonialism, very much so specifically because settler colonialism is all about, as we've all been talking about, uh, the assertion and annexation of land, right? So land as resources becomes so pivotal um, to how these systems operate. Um, the kind of, um, I think one of the most kind of interesting, maybe this is just kind of geeky, but I find it really interesting and not a coincidence, that the kind of modern system of private property was actually pioneered, and I use that word deliberately, was pioneered not in the US, not in Canada, but in Australia. And Australia is also a settler colonial regime. And the you know what we now know as the Torrent system, which is like the entire model of private property was based on the kind of uh, confluence between co settler colonialism, this idea, as Nick pointed out, of doctrine of discovery, which is the idea that land is barren, right? Terra nullius, no one lives here because it's not being, quote unquote, cultivated um, and because land is communally owned, um, therefore it is barren. So it kind of conjoined this very settler colonial idea of the land being barren with this capitalist idea of private property. And that is really the foundation of the actual current land registration system. Um, and, you know, if we look at that in the U.S. context, it's also telling that, you know, when a citizenship was imposed on indigenous peoples, um, it actually required indigenous peoples when they when citizenship was imposed on indigenous people, land was allocated as private property. Right. So tribal lands were parsed apart, were cut open um, and became private parcels of land. And so it's inseparable for us to think about racial capitalism and private property from the ways in which settler colonialism not only uh, usurped land, but also very much targeted the idea of communal land ownership and really converted that into private property. And we see that continuing. You know, when we think about free trade agreements like NAFTA, when NAFTA attacked the premise of the, the constitution in, in Mexico, you know, Article 27 that protects ejidos, right? Protects communally owned land. Um, you know, that's what free trade agreements are all about. It's about destroying what, you know, what indigenous uh, social organization and indigenous legal organization looks like all around the world. <laughs> Um, and so I think, you know, that's a pivotal part of racial capitalism is destroying, uh, is usurping land and specifically destroying indigenous legal and social organization with respect to communally owned land and nationhood and sovereignty. Um, so I think, you know, that's um, uh, uh, one of the many connections and really centrality of settler colonialism to racial capitalism and our current regime of, of private property. And then maybe briefly, because Nick already said it better than I did. Um, in terms of the ways in which the border operates, not only to expel people and not to only to deport people, but to make people deportable, right? So when you have people who are made deportable, whether or not they're actually deported, the fear of deportation, and you know, Lorena mentioned this with respect to the ICE raids and the raids that are happening everywhere, you know, it's to make labor um, more precarious, right? It's literally to instill the fear of the everyday in people's lives. Um, and to have people accept the indignities of being paid less than minimum wage, the indignities of not being able to unionize, um, and really to create, uh, a, you know, again, this is, um, draw, you know, when George Manuel talks of indigenous people uh, as the kind of fourth world for, you know, when we, when we speak about um, people who, you know, undocumented migrants or migrant workers um, who don't have permanent residency status in whatever country they're located in, it really is to basically create the third world and the first world, right? So insourcing of that precarious labor, which is the flip side of outsourcing. So when we see companies and capitalists exploit precarious and cheapened, I won't say cheap, but cheapened, deliberately cheapened labor around the world, um, that's basically what the border does within the so-called first world. It's to create that same pool of labor where people 
are not always deported, but are made deportable um, through the fear of ICE raids, through the fear of deportation, through the fear of, you know, knowing that your bosses will deport you. Um, and so, you know, that's really a, a function of the border is uh, very much connected to racial capitalism in terms of ensuring profits. Um, so it's something that capitalists can exploit, but it's very much something that the state, and I really want to emphasize that, right? The state is very much involved in creating this pool of cheap labor. And that's, you know, again, why I circle back to how important it is to center the role of the state, because sometimes when we talk about capitalism, we think about just the capitalists and we forget how central the role of the state is, and particularly the settler colonial state, to ensuring that there is cheapened labor for capitalists to exploit. Thank you so much for that, Harsha. We're going to take a brief pause for our interpreter team. Thank you so much, uh, Harsha, for, and, and Nick, for tying together the sort of extractive nature of settler colonialism and taking us through that thread of how that then creates deportable populations, specifically with the example of NAFTA uh, destroying ejidos and driving a lot of migration up into the United States. I think it also gives us a really good um, tie to Lorena's work in Mississippi. Uh, it is not a coincidence that the raids hit chicken processing plants. Uh, it is not a coincidence that Parchman is a prison farm. Um, and so a lot of these uh, racial capitalist systems that extract from the land, that extract from non-human life, we see in the contemporary. Um, and I'm going to move on to some excellent audience questions, if you all don't mind. Um, I think in terms of, uh, in terms of, a transnational scope and solidarity. An important question from the audience here is, is there any effort to link our migrant movements, our, our deconstructing settler colonial movements with the Palestinian struggle? And anybody who'd like to answer. I'll just say something really briefly. <laughs> um, it doesn't, like these struggles don't have to be linked um, by us because they're already linked by the state in the sense that, you know, uh, Harsha had mentioned the uh, Tahona Odom uh, struggle against the border wall in Arizona in Scottsdale, Arizona, which is a kind of headquarters, right wing headquarters um, for a lot of different things. There are um, uh, Israeli security firms. I think the, the, the mayor of Scottsdale even like opened up, you know, she had this like ceremony to like welcome all these Israeli security uh, firms in there um, to begin, you know, uh, ex uh, exporting the technologies um, that had been pioneered, uh, again, using this unironically with no metaphor against Palestinians and had been uh, perfected against Palestinians um, to now use it against uh, migrant, uh, you know, uh, folks within uh Arizona, but also um, the like uh, like Harsha said, the Tahoda Odam or the Odam uh, territory, what they call the Jued, has been completely military militarized by Elbit security towers, uh, etc. Which is like, you know, Elbit is a um, Israeli firm that you know uses motion detectors and all those kinds of things to track uh, Palestinians' movements within their own territories, and so by default, and I always say this, Empire especially when it comes to border security uh, regimes is already intersectional, right? It's already thinking about like what, how, where it can learn, you know, um, new forms of surveillance and technology, 
And I would say that like the other aspect of that is um, there's a really good book by Todd Miller called Empire of Borders that everyone should read, where he does this kind of like documentary survey of of where um, homeland security, right, and cus- uh, U.S. Customs and Border Patrols operates. Homeland security's mandate is to only operate within the so-called homeland of the United States, but nonetheless advises border security regimes throughout the world, right, um, including in places like in, in Israel, so-called Israel. So this is something that uh, is already kind of in the works, um, but I will say that going to uh, Palestine, there were a lot of connections and there, there has been work on the ground to make those connections more clear and apparent. Thank you, Nick. We're taking a brief pause for interpretation team. Thank you. And again, immense gratitude to our captioning and interpreting team. Um, I'd like to start with Lorena for this question and then hear from, from all of you. Uh, Lorena, the audience, a uh, question for the audience is, what actionable steps can we take to abolish ICE and DHS? Um. When we um, when we gathered as a new organization uh, with national organizations to discuss this, um, some of the things that we were doing were instinct to us, right? Um, my background is community, and so as organizers, we work on instinct, um, and uh, it was very difficult for us to identify that what we were doing was working uh, through these national lenses um, until someone told us this is what you're doing and this is what's working. Um, And I say this uh, because, um, as I mentioned before, with the community uh, taking these baby steps um, and creating and trying to create a movement in a space where obviously, um, if you notice this entire, uh, it seems like as you know, Hersha, Nick, Kelly mentioned, uh, the entire, it feels like the in- entire um, structure or uh, the, the whole system, uh, if we were to be the perfect example of, of racial capitalism, I mean, if we were to have a perfect, it would be us, what's happening here in Mississippi. And that, you know, we we are on stolen land, we're on the, on the, on the shoulders of, of our black brothers and sisters. We are uh, being commodified. We have modern day slavery. And so right now, some of the things that, that we are doing um, is first is to teach the community that ICE can be abolished. Um, people don't even, even think that that is a possibility. Um, so I start with education of the community, having conversations that people can have power and that there's power in relational, in relational conversations and in numbers. And so letting people know that even though they're undocumented, they can build huge movements like, you know, has been done in the past um, is number one, uh, to build people's confidence people's leadership skills so that they know that organizing, creating a movement will be essential to eliminating ICE. And then of course, you know, um, you have what other organizations do is contacting legislation, uh, 
you know, when we engage a lot of media to uh, a lot of the things that we're doing is getting stories from these detention centers and lifting up the voices of, of the folks. Um, particular in Mississippi, we don't get a lot of attention because we don't have the capacity. We don't have the leadership. Right now, what's happening in Georgia is happening right here in Natchez and Adams. Cameroonians are being abused. They're being um, uh, just completely, uh, you know, they're losing their humanity. They're being, why aren't we getting attention to what's happening? We don't have the capacity. So I'm going to bring it right back down to the community. You know, uh, we need to build people. We need to build up people. We need to build up leadership. First, we need to educate the community and let them know that they have the power to accomplish some of the things that are being doing in California, in Texas, in New Mexico, so that they can know that by working together and they can create these kind of movements that can abolish ICE. And of course, plug in where we can, where we can in the national and the regional work. You know, right now there's many organizations that are working specifically. We have the detention watch networks and, and so where we plug in where we can. But as a newborn organization, my answer is always gonna be build leadership of the people. Let them know that they are capable of making a change and then engage politically and civically. Amazing, thank you, Lorena. Um, Kelly, can we hear from you in terms of what actionable steps we can take to abolish ICE uh, and DHS and uh, how you see million dollar hoods uh, maybe as a part of a sort of decolonial abolitionist project? Well, let me first say I love Lorena's answer, right? That's always the answer, building the power of the people, right? And our ability to imagine the world in which we want to live. And so I thank you for the work that you do and for that answer. Um, if you believe in electoral politics of the white settler state, you certainly can support the, the DREAM Act, right? Which embe embeds within it the abolition of ICE and uh, Department of Homeland Security. So that would be one move um, for people who are looking toward next week um, and the weeks to come and months to come. I would approach a question like this from my perspective as a historian and doing the work of sharing the story of where deportation and immigration control and deportability come from, how they are yoked into our institutions and our culture. And that is absolutely a story of the white settler state um, in the late 19th century attempting to throw up barriers of entry against non-white immigrants in particular and control um, the mobility, create the deport deportability of those who, um, who are within the territory. So when you think about the fact that there was no deportation, there was no immigrant detention prior to the Chinese exclusion period, and those were invented to um, prohibit Chinese immigrants from entering the country and living uh, without the fear of deportability, then it becomes very clear about what this tool is supposed to do. This tool across time from its very origins um, of immigration control in general, deportation in particular, um, was designed to advance and protect the interest of racial capitalism and the white settler state. And so I think history can also be our, our friend and helping to expose um, the origin stories that lay at the heart of these regimes and these systems that we confront today, and that really we cannot reform them. They're unreformable. Abolition really is the only option. We have to truly imagine a new future for ourselves, and we have to build new um, infrastructures and sets of relationships to one another. So um, I think that would be my contribution um, to the movement. Unfortunately, Million Dollar Hoods, we have not been working in the world of immigration control at this point, but that certainly is something we, we look to do. And the tactic there is to acknowledge and confront big data as a new tool of whitewashing white supremacy and empowering young people in particular and formerly incarcerated folks to dissect that tactic, right? It's not to say that big data will save us because it will not, but it often is a tool used against us and we need to empower ourselves to dissect um, algorithms, to dissect the power of statistics and numbers to rationalize what is happening to us. So um, at Million Dollar Hoods, we do train 
community organizers and others um, to do data analytics and visualization in ways that um, help us move toward our own algorithms of liberation. Amazing. Thank you, Kelly and Lorena, for the work that you're doing to uh, support the community. Uh, they are their leaders. They will lead their own communities forward, and it's amazing to hear you support them. Um, we are close to time here, and I just want to give everybody an opportunity to briefly just uh, share with us any closing statement that you might have on the importance on a specifically decolonial abolition movement as we've talked about the, uh, the central role of settler colonialism and mass incarceration. And we'll start with Harsha. These questions, man, straight to the heart. Uh, thank you for, for all the time thinking through these. Um, I think, you know, I guess I'll, I'll return to something I mentioned earlier, which is that uh, the No One Is Illegal movement uh, that I'm part of and have been part of, um, we really strongly believe in the idea of No One Is Illegal, Canada Is Illegal. Like that that is not just a slogan, that that is an ethical orientation, it's a political orientation, and it's the work through which we do our community organizing. Um, and that's, you know, for me, so important in so many ways. It's to, um, both absolutely affirm the idea that no human being is illegal, right? Because such a big part, um, and you know, if I can uh, extrapolate from Lorena's incredible words, like so much of the work in community is really to get rid of that shame, right? The idea when you have a removal order, when you have a deportation order, when you're living in fear, um, and any system of oppression is that stigmatization and to revert the gaze back on the state, right? <laughs> to say like, this is like, we're not going to play this game of like, who's worthy, who's not worthy. And, you know, to have to kind of narrate your story and prove your worthiness, a statement like no one is legal or no human being is illegal, um, really just starts from the starting point that we believe that this is all state violence, right? That nobody should have to prove their humanity. And that is core to the abolitionist project and the abolitionist vision, which is that we are all worthy and that it is, you know, state and social structures that criminalize and dehumanize and oppress and exploit and create these divisions. Um, and that it's corollary, you know, Canada is illegal is an affirmation of alliance with indigenous nations. And to say that, you know, we absolutely do not accept, uh, the jurisdiction of the Canadian state to decide on citizenship. Um, and, you know, and that we um, align with Indigenous nationhood and that that is, you know, that that's not something that's like a pan kind of thing that one can say, but it's really grounded in the specific experiences and contexts of diverse Indigenous nations and that that is that is the work, right? The work is uh, to do migrant justice work, to oppose all detentions and deportations, and to also learn what indigenous laws are on the lands that we reside on, right? Those laws are not historic, they are alive today. What are those laws today? Um, and you know, one of the most kind of amazing, um, it's not a project, it's, it's not the word for it, um, but one of the most kind of, uh, you know, intimate organizing experiences that I've had is sitting with indigenous elders and hearing about different nations uh, immigration laws, for lack of a better word, like what were the ways in which reciprocity was practiced? What is the ways in which one is welcomed into the nation? What are the responsibilities that come with being on that territory and on that land? Um, and for me, it's those, you know, intimate, relational, care-based, reciprocity-based relationships that are deeply local. I mean, but I don't mean local in a way that they're, um, you know, small, but that really, um, we have to expand on are those ways of, of relating with the communities and the nations whose lands we're on. Um, and that in a kind of transnational way, I think uh, for me, the guiding principle really is the freedom to move and the freedom to stay, that we can't have an immigration politics that doesn't look at the fundamental reasons why people move. And I think that is also one of the kind of, um, uh, one of the, um, the gaps in our movements is that we tend to treat immigration as a domestic issue, very similar to the ways in which we tend to treat settler colonialism as a domestic issue, as Nick pointed out, when in fact this is a global project of imperialism 
Um, and I think, you know, that is also part of uh, what a decolonial and specifically anti-imperialist migrant justice kind of no borders movement um, that we have to orient ourselves around is, you know, why are people moving, right? It is not a coincidence that millions of people are on the move. And this is not just about the U.S. This is, you know, a, you know, the Mediterranean is the world's deadliest border, um, that we really need to look at why people are moving. And I think that's also part of the strength of community organizing when people don't have to justify why they're here, when that is embedded into our politic and our practice, um, is, you know, we are here because you are there. That kind of affirmation and assertion, I think, is another kind of central pillar um, to this work, which is, you know, the freedom to stay and the freedom to move cannot be separated from each other. Thank you for that reminder, Harsha, uh, of, that we are also fundamentally speaking about the uh, right to mobility um, and, and the right to stay as well. Um, if we could have a closing statement from Lorena, uh, is there anything that you'd like to leave us with today before we close out this wonderful session? I, I just want to, uh, you know, um, Harsha, you mentioned about the work with the indigenous people. I have grown so much, uh, I think that as a leader, as a person, uh, by working with the indigenous community in Mississippi, um, I know that uh, I, I lost that, I left that, you know, in my country, my mom was Mestiza, but a lot of the cultural practices that, that the indigenous community has, I know that my mom at one time practiced. Um, and so, um, I think that uh, just being aware that as we deconstruct these systems of oppression, we're mindful not to classify everyone under this, this idea that all immigrants are the same. Uh, that's very important uh, to also make sure that the voices of our indigenous people are lifted, changing the narrative, as you said, that we came here just, you know, uh, to work. People came to the country to be free. You know, they're escaping these horrible systems of oppressions in their countries of origins, not to be enslaved in the United States for, you know, less than a minimum wage and to work seven hours. They came for freedom. Uh, so we just want to be um, mindful of the spaces that we enter when we're doing this kind of work and realize that, you um, that are that our people that we're seeking li liberation and that's why this work uh, means so much to us that are doing just just the daily work holding hands uh with the folks that are on the ground thank you for that lorena and we're at the end of our conversation i hope that all of y'all have had the pleasure that I've had listening to everybody and uh, are walking away with more questions to learn from. I want to thank our speakers again, Lorena Quiroz, Harsha Walia, Nick Estes, and Kelly Lytle Hernandez. M immense gratitude also to our captioning and interpreting team and to Hey Market Books uh, for hosting this conversation. Um, as Lorena was just reminding us and as Harsha said at the beginning, let us reject the division between good and bad migrants. Let us refuse innocence and let us all work together as a community towards the abolition of prison systems and immigration and detention and border enforcement. Thank you all. Have a wonderful night. Best wishes to all your queridos.